Good morning. Today is March 16th, 2022, and welcome to the New Possibilities Hour, part of the Will Work for Food project founded by Natalie Armstrong Motan in the spring of 2020. Every Thursday morning, Gene Lawler and I are delighted to host and moderate another cutting edge webinar for mediators, arbitrators, lawyers, and anybody who negotiates. As you know, there's no charge for these great programs. Rather, we ask you to contribute to a food bank if you're in a position to contribute and you like what you see. And every week, one of my favorite parts of the program is when we announce the running total of just how much our generous audiences have contributed in honor of our great speakers. Gene Lawler, would you please do the honors? Uh, absolutely, and welcome back, Jeff. We missed you, so uh, glad to have you here. All right, everybody, the number today is, of course, another amazing number. It's $371,006.06, $371,006.06. So now I would just like to issue a, um, a challenge, if you will. So we're so close to... 375, 400,000, um, you know, even a $100 uh, contribution today would get us up to about 375, probably. Whatever you can do, though, is so appreciated. Thank you. Thank you, Jean. And today we are so delighted to have Ken Feinberg as our guest. Ken barely needs an introduction to people in the world of alternative dispute resolution. He is renowned for his work as administrator of the 9-11 Victim Compensation Fund, his work with the Deepwater Horizon explosion, his work with the Agent Orange Compensation Fund, and any number of other extremely high profile, very important public policy disputes. Today, though, we're going to have a different sort of conversation with Ken. Ken also has a robust practice as a mediator in the kinds of disputes, perhaps on a different scale, perhaps not, but private disputes, business to business disputes, doing the sorts of things that we other mediators may do as well. And so we're going to pick Ken's brain. There's so much there to find out how he mediates and what we can learn from his approach to mediation practice. First, though, Ken, let us ask you, please tell us a little bit about the food bank that you've designated to which you would like people to contribute if they're in a position to do so? Uh, right here in the District of Columbia, Washington, D.C., uh, there are a couple. Um, I'll get the exact information um, by the end of this uh, uh, podcast, but um, they're uh, up, they're running, and um, I would urge people uh, to take advantage of the District of Columbia government-sponsored food banks here in the nation's capital. Fabulous. Thank you. And I'm confident many, many of our attendees will be making very generous contributions in your honor, as they have made generous contributions so frequently in the past. So, Ken, let's get it started. As I mentioned, everybody knows about your cases that are in the headlines and have been over the many years. Please tell us more, though, about your commercial mediation practice, the private B2B disputes that may not make their way into the press. All the, the my, my mediation practice far exceeds the uh, rather isolated aberrations that are called claims administration programs like 9-11 or the BP oil spill um, or the General Motors ignition switch compensation program or the Boston Marathon Patriots Day bombings. Those claims administration programs that I design and administer that are highly visible, they are very, very rare. You don't see those programs very often. They usually occur after a tragedy where the American people sort of uh, galvanize and want to help the victims. My normal practice ever since Agent Orange in 1984 has been voluntary non-binding mediation. Now, my mediation practice involves almost entirely uh, Fortune 500 companies. Uh, I marvel at my fellow mediators who are pleased to mediate 
family disputes, landlord tenant disputes, um, one off accident disputes. That's really not what I get called upon. Relatively rare that I do those. I won't do divorce or family because I find that those disputes are so emotional. Uh, everything's emotional, but relatively speaking, I try and shy away from those. Uh, the big ticket, corporate, environmental, uh, securities, mass claims, those are usually the cases that I get involved in. And you're right. You're right. Those aren't cases that make the front pages. Those are really commercial disputes, high-end, insurers, insureds, wholesale, wholesalers, retailers, pharmaceutical companies, chemical companies. Those are the cases where uh, there's a great deal at stake, usually involving mass claims in the hundreds or even thousands. And that has turned out to be largely, not exclusively, but largely um, the type of cases that I mediate. Fantastic. So Ken Feinberg, let's talk shop for a little while. Why don't we start at the beginning and tell us how do you prepare for mediations? There is sort of a, um, a, a menu of the steps that I take. First of all, uh, the logistical steps. I mean, <laughs> work out at the very beginning how many days, where, when, the mediation budget, who's going to attend, are people going to be in attendance with authority? I mean, do not underestimate the logistical issues up front that help determine success. And uh, you try to develop a calendar where, where if it's going to be more than one day, they're contiguous. Try not try to avoid one day this week, one day next week, one day the week after. It's better building momentum and getting to yes if the days are concentrated, the rules are understood, and the terms and conditions of the mediation are agreed to in advance. And then in getting prepared for the individual dispute, you want to make sure that as mediator, I know more than the parties do about the nature and uh, the nature of the case, the quality of the case, the pitfalls, the challenges, because it's very important that the parties have an opinion that they are dealing with a very experienced, competent, strategic mediator. And um, if you don't, if you haven't mastered the record before you sit down or engage with each side, you'll find that the parties quickly lose confidence in you and your mediation will be much more that difficult uh, to get an agreement. So in that preparation, the parties will send you briefs, I assume. Sometimes they're probably confidential and sometimes they're probably exchanged. What do you do over and above reading the briefs to put yourself in that position of mastery of the dispute? Over the, uh, since the pandemic, I've found another efficient, valuable tool before we come together to mediate. Between the time that I receive the mediation brief or submission until we actually meet face-to-face -face or by Zoom, it doesn't matter in that sense. I very often engage each side in a private Zoom or face-to-face -face mediation before we meet to let everybody know on one side and the other side in confidence the blueprint that I've developed that might get us to yes, areas that you should emphasize, options that you should consider very because the parties really want to know from me ken you've got the briefs and we're getting together we are what we have wide differences how do you think we can reach an agreement what tools do you suggest what substantive terms should we focus on very important 
You mentioned Zoom, Ken. Are you doing most of your mediations on Zoom? I was. I, on the one hand, found that Zooms were a very good alternative, very efficient, uh, much less time consuming, very cost effective. I found Zoom surprisingly. I'm an old fashioned mediator from, you know, when Woodrow Wilson was president. So um, I was loath to try this out, but during the pandemic, it was Zoom or nothing. And I was pleasantly surprised. They will never replace, in my opinion, face-to-face -face mediation. And I'm now back, I would say, 80% now face-to-face. -face. And I like it much better, but uh, don't knock Zoom. Well, certainly compared to not working, Zoom is fantastic, right? So what, what is it, though, about the in-person uh, mediation that is so superior in your mind? Because many mediators think that Zoom is the way to go indefinitely. The trouble with Zoom is you can't put your arm around uh, one of the mediation participants and whisper in their ear, look, here's what I recommend. You can't do that with Zoom. I know chat rooms and you can, you know, isolate the parties, et cetera. But I've found my style that there's no substitute for uh, camaraderie in person. Most of the mediation participants are very often, I've met them before, I've worked with them before. Um, we may go to dinner uh, one evening at the end of the mediation day. Um, so I find that ability to um, put yourself in the shoes of each of the mediation participants in person uh, is an advantage. Now, I completely agree with those who prefer Zoom, if that's their style and they've found it successful, all power to you. The only thing that matters at the end of the day is getting it done. And if you can do it with Zoom, fine with me. Ken, you talked about camaraderie with the parties, mediating with people you've known before. What do you think is appropriate in terms of disclosures on the part of a mediator before a mediation takes place as to prior relationships and familiarity with the parties? Full transparency. I mean full. Do not enter a mediation or an arbitration or a claims administration program. Uh, do not. Uh, go down that slope without notifying the uh, both sides. Full disclosure, I've worked on 27 mediations with this law firm. I've worked with 15 mediations with this law firm. I know the players. I have previously mediated for this insurance company. I've previously mediated for that. Let it all out. Uh, it's rarely disqualified. Rarely. They know by the time they reach me, uh, my relationship usually to the parties and and uh it, it's important full disclosure don't get blindsided there now you mentioned insurance companies ken and many mediators find frustration in dealing with insurance companies you know the joke that some mediators tell yes the insurance adjuster insurance executives came with full authority full authority to say no what do you do both in terms of preparation with insurance companies and dealing with insurance representatives during the day to be effective and to try to get deals done as appropriate? Very, very difficult. There are two parties that I rarely mediate, the insurance industry and the federal government. Those two rarely call upon me. I'm a proactive mediator people, mediation participants want my valuation of claims. They want my expert opinion. They want me to be very proactive. They do not want me to be a passive um, traffic cop. They really want me to engage. And the insurance industry, uh, by definition, is in no rush to give up its, its, its funds. Uh, I find that the most likely time for insurance agreement in mediation 
is on the courthouse steps. And until you get a trial date and get close to that date, the insurers have been trained um, to uh, be very technical, be very reasonable. And in a particular area, you know, when I mediate mass claims, 9-11, BP, GM, drugs, pharmaceuticals, if you're trying to mediate a resolution of not one claim, but hundreds or thousands of claims, that is so alien to the insurance industry. And I'm, not I'm not criticizing them. This is the way they're trained. One claim at a time, a traffic accident. Show me the file. Aggregative justice is not something that the insurance industry is usually very interested in. And I give them credit for the way they approach things. I'm not, I'm not critical of you. That's their business. Um, so um, I'm most successful with insurers when A, a trial is looming around the corner, and B, quite apart from coverage, they have a duty to defend. And mass claims are costing them a small fortune in defense costs. And those two elements, if they come together, promote mediation, a successful mediation. And they're very, very smart. Insurance representatives who come to the table to mediate in force, I mean, really understand the claim, they get it, the insurance industry, they get it. So can in preliminary conversations with the parties, I find, and many other mediators also find, that lawyers will tell us that their clients have unrealistic expectations or their clients are highly emotionally charged about a case that needs to be approached with emotion and with reason in balance. I assume that you get this kind of input from lawyers as well. And how do you deal with the issues of clients' unrealistic expectations and lawyers' efforts to, to harmonize their own view of the case with a client's view of the case? That's a very good question. First of all, remember this. 90% of my mediations are voluntary where the very sophisticated parties come to me seeking resolution. That's important because by the time, I, I, I like to tell people that um, um, by the time I get a telephone call to mediate, I'm 85% of the way home with success. Or they wouldn't call me, you see. With my uh, experience, my background, I mean, if I get a call from GM or, you know, Aetna, or Liberty Mutual or somebody, can we need your help? Expectations usually have already been tempered a little bit. So that's a big help for me. But, you know, you ask a very good question. And I think the way you try and modify expectation is by demonstrating to the parties, A, you know the case. You're not splitting the baby. You're not, it's not rough justice. You have tried to really place yourself in the shoes of the participants. And really the mediator is explaining to each side with high expectations, the downside risk of being wrong in your evaluation of the case. And um, I think that plus the credibility uh, earned over the years with thousands of mediations, that I'm a neutral. I mean, I'm detached. I have no emotional stake in the claim. And um, you try and, 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 and modify expectations as a neutral. One other thing I'd say in, in modifying expectations, try as best you can to make sure that the mediation participants have no involvement in the underlying dispute. 
if a Fortune 500 company sends a, a lawyer or a corporate official to a mediation where on that lawyer or corporate officials watch, the problem arose. You're in for a tough time because that, that re mediation representative has a vested stake in the outcome. And you want to try and get some fresh face and fresh opinion uh, into the mediation process. So if in your preparation process, can you sense a bad moon rising that the wrong person is coming to the mediation, what do you do to try to head that off and lay the groundwork for a more successful day? You tell each side or the side that's bringing that person, you know, it's a free country. I'm not ordering you, I have no authority, ordering you to bring somebody else. But um, based on what you guys acknowledge yourselves that uh, Joe Jones or Mary Smith was at the, at the genesis of this, really, um, human nature being what it is, you may want to bring a fresh, a fresh base and a fresh outlook. Now, sometimes you're successful. Other times you're not, you'll have to deal with it, that's all. And I got to ask, how do you deal with it? Well, first of all, the other side may say, we're not mediating if you bring the, the uh, perpetrator of this uh, dispute. One way you deal with it is by enlisting the help of the other side. We want the right person in the room. If we are spending the money and going to the cost and inefficiencies of this process, we want the right people there with authority to really settle it. The other way you deal with it is during the course of the mediation. Even though he's, he or she is at the table, you try and commiserate with that person, commiserate, and say, look, it happened on your watch. The resolution should be on your watch, a wash. It started with you, you're here, you can end it. And sometimes that works even if it is at perhaps personal or professional expense to the career of the person making that decision. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> and there are huge stakes in these mediations involving dollars and reputations and future business dealings, et cetera. And let's talk a little about the question of neutrality. You mentioned neutrality a few minutes ago. And the question of, of bias. Uh, you read a lot in psychology about implicit bias, unconscious bias. There are some mediators who say, oh, that, that doesn't apply to me. I personally think it applies to every human being with a functioning brain. What do you do to check your own possible unconscious biases or implicit biases to make sure that you truly are running a neutral process and that you're not allowing some lurking memory or trauma to influence what's what's happening. You could have a, a seminar on that subject, a seminar for an entire semester. You know, you're absolutely right, Jeff. You're absolutely right. I mean, human nature being what it is, you're not a, a, a stone monument. I mean, you come to mediation with unconscious or built-in biases, you can't help that. What you do try and do, however, is demonstrate through your mediation conduct, neutrality, an open mind, a willingness to listen, an understanding and explanation that you are evaluating what each side has told you and given it due weight. You really try and demonstrate through your conduct that you are truly detached. The other thing you do, don't forget in mediation, you have a great opportunity to meet in person privately with each side. And during those private meetings, you try and build up, reinforce neutrality by expressing sympathy as well as recommendations of detached neutrality, but you try and express sympathy. I get it. I hear what you're saying. I understand what you're advocating. 
you have to build up that trust in the course of the mediation so that each side uh, feels that um, you are truly neutral. The other thing I must say in my own case, I've done so many for so many years that I think there's sort of, if I'm asked to mediate, there's sort of a built-in reputational benefit uh, based on past, past success that people, there's at least a presumption that Feinberg is neutral or we wouldn't have asked him in the first place. So can we touch a little bit on neutrality? Let's talk about the other pillar of mediation, self-determination. Now, I don't think it's much of a controversial statement, Ken, to say that you have a strong personality and you can be very persuasive guy. At what point is there the line between your making recommendations, suggestions, brainstorming with the parties? At what point does it become coercive where you're telling them what to do and really uh, in some senses, crossing the line of what mediators ought not to do. Are you conscious of that? How do you deal with it? No, I'm not conscious of that. First of all, understand that there are, to, I mean, in my way of thinking, generally two types of mediators. And I believe that mediators are largely um, born, not trained and made. There are really two types of mediators. There's the model that is mediators like Ken Feinberg, very proactive, assertive, aggressive, and appreciated by the parties who have voluntarily come to me and asked for my help. Then there are mediators, very good mediators, much more passive, um, won't insinuate themselves as much into the process unless asked, really rely on their competence as experts in the substantive nature of the dispute, rather than forcing their views or advancing their views during the course of the mediation. I think mediation participants at the outset know which type of mediator do we want? And as I said earlier, the insurance industry, the federal government, they rarely come to me on occasion, but rarely because they don't, they don't want that type of mediation. It's not coercive, but it is assertive. Uh, you're insinuating yourself right in saying, here's what I think. A lot of parties don't want that. We don't want to know what you think, except your evaluation of the merits of the dispute. We want that you're the mediator, but we don't want you suggesting, pushing towards settlement. I think that's very, very important. Now, I must also say, in the cases that I mediate involving, you know, drug company, antitrust, price fixing, mass torts, environmental disputes in the hundreds of millions of cleanup dollars. <laughs> if the parties come to me, they're not worried about coercive, abusive. I mean, I'm not, I don't think those are fair characterization. They come to me, Ken, we've tried all of this passive stuff. I mean, help us get to yes. So up front, the nature of the case of the dispute where I'm voluntarily called upon usually is the type of dispute where they want that type of proactive involvement by the mediator. When the stakes are so high, Ken, both personally for the people involved and for their, the entities that they represent, the pressure is high. Do you find that people sometimes get temperamental, lose their tempers, uh, become highly emotional? How, how do you deal with that? I find the emotional aspect of my work much more profound in claims administration, where you're processing 
individual damage awards to victims, 9-11, BP oil spill, Boston Marathon bombings, Virginia Tech shootings, Pulse nightclub shootings in the Pulse nightclub in Orlando, Florida, 50 dead. Those cases, the emotional barrier to resolution is extremely high. In fact, it is the most debilitating part of what you do as a mediator and or claims administrator. If you're dealing with Fortune 500 companies, that emotional quotient is very much diminished, regardless of the total value of the claims. You're, involving, you're involved with corporate officials who are uh, more interested in dollar, in the bottom line dollars and the impact on the company than any loss of life or emotional distress. Or, so the emotional, the emotional challenge is more pronounced actually in the smaller cases where there's, uh, where there's uh, unsophisticated participants in mediation and where emotion really runs high in those cases. Boston Marathon, I mean, you're talking about people who were running in that, in the Patriots Day in the marathon. And out of nowhere at the finish line, a bomb goes off and, you know, people are killed and maimed, uh, innocent victims. And emotion in a case like that is much more volatile and pronounced than in a dispute between an insurer and an insured over a three hundred million dollar environmental claim or something. So, Ken, what about your own emotional state? Have you ever found yourself close to losing your temper? And what do you do to keep your own emotions under control in these high stakes, high pressure situations? You must not lose your temper. I mean. In terms of cases I've mediated or claims administration, take 9-11. That's claims administration, not mediation. You may saw in the, in the bathroom at night, saw over what you have heard about lost lives and you know, life altering injury. But that's in private. In the public process of claims administration or mediation, very important that you maintain a professional detachment. If the parties think you're, you're acting in an emotion rather than in a certain practical way, you're in trouble in terms of credibility. So you try and maintain a uh, professional approach to the problems, but in private cases involving horrible tragedy, like 9 uh, You're lucky if you can hold it together, even in the privacy of your own home. Have you, do you have practices that you follow, approaches that you follow when you're actually in the moment in a mediation, if you feel those emotional responses bubbling up within you to kind of pull it together and keep yourself yeah. under control? Take a break. Walk around, go outside of the building, walk around the block, buy an ice cream cone, see kids playing in a playground, you know, get away from it, clear your head, see the height of civilization rather than the horrors of civilization. And if you don't take a break and you just, you maintain an intensity, um, first of all, not only does it undercut your own mental state in evaluating the case. But if you don't take a break, the parties get surly and uh, short tempered and um, begin to get, um, become convinced that maybe we're just spinning our wheels. So I think um, taking a break during the day, ending earlier than might otherwise be the case because let's everybody take a deep breath and go to a nice dinner and we'll reconvene in the morning. I think you have to carefully balance all of that in an effort to maintain the right atmosphere 
both you as the mediator and the parties in terms of getting to yes, ultimately. So sometimes, Ken, we just want to keep people together thinking, oh gosh, we've made this much progress. If we let them go, all that progress will evaporate by the time they get down the elevator to their cars. Sometimes we think, oh my gosh, these people are so fatigued. We wonder if they still have the mental capacity to enter into a contract. When you get to the evening hours, how do you make those decisions as to whether to bear down, pedal to the metal, get it done versus, hey, let them go, get a good night's sleep and we'll see what happens? One, evaluate the progress you have made during the course of the day. Have we made progress? Are we, are we slowly but surely moving towards resolution? Two, at an appropriate time at, at the latter end of the day, when does the mediator as a professional conclude that to keep the parties here for another hour or two will be detrimental to the progress we've made? You reach sort of, you, you, you look at your own barometer as to when would be a, we better stop now because people are getting a little bit um, angry or, or uh, emotional. And now might be a good time to adjourn for the day. Three, before you adjourn, what I always do is, I deliver to one side or the other the latest final offer or demand for that day. And I say to the recipient, I don't want a response. Go to dinner, think it over. And at 8.30 a.m. tomorrow, you will then respond. So I always find it's very helpful at the end of a day of mediation to leave one party with the responsibility to respond, not now, but the next morning. And that lets them work it out and calm down the emotion and the, re the immediate reaction and come back usually with a, um, uh, a response that will advance the process. And is that true, Ken, whether or not you have a second day of mediation scheduled right afterwards or whether people are dispersing and going to the airport and flying back to their various home cities. Oh, I'm, 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 I'm using this technique when there's a second contiguous day uh -huh. things going. If people are going home and there won't be another day of mediation for two weeks or a week, that doesn't work. Then you're sending both sides home. Think about where we are. You'll be hearing from the mediator private during that recess between the first and second day and let's see if we can get progress made by telephone or Zoom uh, between the day we adjourn and reconvene. So Ken, let's go back to the beginning stages of mediation. One very hot topic in mediation circles and among the lawyers whom we serve is the joint session at or near the beginning of the mediation day. Some media, many mediators love them and try to foster them whenever possible. Some mediators don't. Some lawyers say, oh my gosh, if a mediator ever asks me to set foot in a joint session again, I'm going to fire them and never put them on my no-fly list. What's your approach to the joint session? Always, sometimes, never? Sometimes. Depends on the maturity of the dispute. If the case has been in court for three years and the parties have heard everything there is to hear, and they're just emotionally frustrated, a joint session can backfire on you. We've heard it all before, we're hearing it again. So that's one, the, the, the mature dispute where there's a lot of water under the bridge uh, usually augurs against an opening joint session. If it is an immature dispute, either they, they haven't even filed a lawsuit, or the lawsuit's been filed, but there hasn't been a whole lot of pretrial activity, a joint session can be very valuable 
in each side getting a preview of what's ahead if we don't settle it. Also, even if the par even if the lawyers have a full understanding of the case, if you're now mediating with in-house representatives with authority to settle, something that I always urge is very important, they may not yet have heard all of the arguments from their adversary. And it's not so much an opening statement to, to you know, benefit one set of lawyers against another set of lawyers. It's more an opening statement directed at the, the client and, frankly, the mediator than the other lawyers who know they have, have their own answers. So it depends on case to case, uh, case by case. So if you think an opening joint session is appropriate and you know that there's a risk that it could go off the rails, people could get emotionally upset, what do you do to lay the groundwork to try to prevent that from happening? You make sure when you talk to the parties in anticipating the mediation, the lawyers. Now, guys, tell me, if, if an opening session is going to derail efforts, if it's going to set us back a day to walk people back off the cliff, let's not do it. Let's go right into private, um, you know, shuttle diplomacy. On the other hand, you guys tell me, I think it would be very useful to hear from each side uh, with respect uh, directed at the in-house opponent, adversary. Ultimately, the lawyers do a pretty good job, I think, of opting for either opening statements or not, depending on the atmospherics surrounding the disputes. So, Ken, many times, early in a mediation day, lawyers will be eager and sometimes desperate to tell the mediator what their top dollar or bottom line is in the negotiation. And mediators are oftentimes reluctant to have the parties dig themselves in to a particular position, particularly early in the day. What's your view? How do you handle it? Do you want to know parties' bottom line, top dollar numbers? What's your approach to that whole subject? Any lawyer that, uh, that prematurely gives their bottom line number or their top line number is almost committing mediation malpractice. First of all, I have never in, what, 50 years, I have never taken at face value anybody who says this is my bottom line. That means it's not your bottom line. If you're telling me that our bottom line is $100, that's it. We're telling you this at 11 a.m., $100. You mean you won't take $99? I mean, I don't believe it. Human nature being what it is, I don't believe it. I tell people, don't give me a bottom line because it's just, I don't believe it's your bottom line. I tell them, I don't believe it. And I've been proven right, I think, on this. So my answer is to your question, no, don't give me your bottom line. In fact, don't use that phrase early, middle, or late in the mediation. Just give us the number and then you'll evaluate it. And then how about the situation, Ken, where you sense the real decision maker, despite your best efforts, is not really at the mediation and that phone calls or Zoom calls have to be made at the end of the day to get more authority to go higher or lower, as the case may be. You typically get involved in those late day communications or are they simply private between the side people who are there and the people up the food chain? Private. I don't get involved. Mm -hmm. I must say, if you have come to a mediation and at the end of the mediation, we're nearing the end and you have no authority, uh, the mediator really uh, is, is at, uh, at odds uh, with the mediation participants. If you're going to come, come with authority. And if the authority is, if the demand or the offer is too high or too low, it's not that you don't have authority. You don't think that that's a, a reasonable resolution. That may be. And if you come to a mediation with $100 and you, the, the, the demand or the offer is 105 and you adjourn, 
I don't mind if you adjourn, if you think that uh, the number isn't right. But don't start, in my opinion, don't start making calls to get another $5. You should have had that authority when you came. And again, if there is going to be such a call, and often there is, I have nothing to do with it. Just let me know the result of that private call. Mm -hmm. Now, occasionally somebody may say, well, Mr. Mediator, uh, the CFO wants to speak with you. Well, that's different. But um, um, I don't interfere with client relationships with lawyers at the mediation table. It's not my business. Let's talk about other closing techniques, Ken. Everybody loves to talk about mediators' proposals. I'm sure you've got your views on them. Please share them with us. There are three time-honored ways, methods, proposals designed to encourage settlement and variations of these three. Very important, the timing when you offer any of these creative alternatives. People on this screen have heard all of this before. I'm just summarizing what uh, but most of the people on the screen have done, including you. Timing is critical. Don't don't become too creative until the parties are exasperated, frustrated, and are wondering, is this going to work? Now, how do you close the gap? There are various ways. One, one side, why don't you go to X, but only if they go to Y? A conditional offer or demand on a response from the other side designed to narrow the difference. Two. What about a bracket in an effort to narrow the gap? You're at 100 and they're at 20. Let's agree on a bracket from 40 to 60 or 35 to 70. Then the other side, you come either agree to that bracket to continue negotiation or come up with your own bracket. That's all right. As long as the two brackets intersect at some point, that's real progress. Then there's this whole issue of a mediator recommendation. Now, timing with a mediation, a mediator recommendation is critical. It's critical. I will not make a mediator recommendation if the parties are too far apart. Mediator recommendations are most effective if the parties have, have substantially narrowed their differences and now they're within striking range, but they need help from the mediator to get over the hump, the final number. If the gap is narrow enough and there's been progress, a mediator recommendation may make some sense. Now, there are variations that I've used over the years on mediator recommendations. One is a binding mediator recommendation. The parties are close enough but politically they can't get to yes. Ken, we need from you, what is the number that you recommend within the remaining gap? Now, if you're gonna do that, make sure that you tell everybody in advance what the number is. I tell the other, you're at 10 and you're at five. I'm gonna make a binding recommendation if you want me to at eight and if you say yes to my binding recommendation and the other side says yes, we're done. If you say yes and the other side says no, you'll know that they said no, but the no won't know whether you said yes. That way you don't lead with your chin and you get much closer that way. But you can't do binding without letting everybody know in advance that, that it's going to be binding, but here's the number. And um, um, that's another way to do it. So there are various creative ways. I know how creative I mean. That's if it's dollars. Now, if it's not dollars, if there's equitable relief where they want the mediator's recommendation, that's an altogether another question. You know, employer, you've got this discrimination case. I think that if you pay X dollars and apologize to the victim, the, the victim of gender discrimination or racial discrimination, that may go a long way to settling the case. So you have to be creative. What you can't do, 
as, as the case gets near the end, you don't want to just split the baby. Anybody can do that. You don't have to need me. You don't need this high price mediator to split the baby. So you'll want to try and be creative using some of these techniques. So Ken, let's talk about ethics for a minute. What do you think are the toughest ethical issues you have faced as a mediator or the toughest ethical issue? Well, I guess one problem is when one side offers more than the other side is even seeking. I mean, to what are, are you obligated to tell the offeror, you know, you don't have to offer that much money. We can settle this case for 20% less. It doesn't happen very often, but it does. That's sort of an ethical dilemma. The other ethical dilemma I run into is rarely. Oh, well, go ahead. I'm sorry. Well, what, what do you do in that case where the offer and the demand cross? It's rare, but you try and make sure that the offeror uh, doesn't really have to go to those lengths to get it settled. I don't know if it's an ethical issue or just a, <laughs> you, you feel uncomfortable promoting a settlement that can be done on easier terms for each side. I don't know. Uh, but that can be a problem. The other problem that, 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 that is, is difficulty is um, um, when a plaintiff lawyer is settling with a defendant company for a hundred million dollars and has, you know, 500 clients, mass claim. Here's the aggregate amount we've settled. How does that lawyer decide how to allocate that money to 500 clients? That lawyer better either ask the mediator or a third party to ethically allocate because <laughs> that lawyer has a duty to every one of those 500 people selling one short in order to benefit another. It's, it's very difficult. Those are some of the issues I run into. And then can every mediator wonders where their next case is coming from. What do marketing and business development look like in your practice? In my practice, I've been at this so long, uh, I don't, I, I, I'm not overly concerned about uh, being asked to mediate. But if somebody says to me, how can I develop my mediation or my ADR practice? What steps can I take? Answer, get as much experience as you can. Most courts now have these pro bono mediation programs for all of the litigants in the court where they have to mediate uh, before proceeding with an appeal or with a case in chief in the district court. Get, it, get on those panels, get as much experience as you can. If you're a young lawyer in a law firm, ask the law firm when there's a mediation, doesn't matter what the issue is, I'd like to be an observer. I'd like to be a junior member of the team. Join local bar association ADR committees. Teach a course at a local law school as an adjunct on mediation or ADR. Write an article and get it published on ADR. And if you're an older experienced mediation practitioner and you know lawyers and you know judges, don't underestimate judicial patronage in getting business. I mean, my, my career was built on that with Judge Weinstein in the Eastern District, Jack Weinstein giving me mediation after mediation after mediation, starting with Agent Orange. If you know judges and they're on the bench, they used to be lawyers, judge, if you need a special master, I'm ready, I wanna do it. Um, so if you're an in-house lawyer and now you're going outside, go to all those lawyers who you worked with when you were in-house counsel. Now I'm setting up uh, um, um, a shingle to, to do ADR work. Reach out to the lawyers. You know, it's, it's, there are various ways. Get on as many ABA, the ABA Dispute Resolution um, Committee, and get on, if you can, become a panelist or uh, part of a committee where you're spreading the news that you are now mediating. Here are the mediations I've done and I want to do. And, um, all of these techniques can help you. And all you need in this business really is one 
very well known, even to the parties, success. And that mediation business flows from that. It really does. And Ken, one last question. What's what's the next challenge in your life that, that you're looking to meet? And what's the next plateau for you? I'm just, uh, um, I pick and choose wisely. I'm still doing what I'm doing. I mean, my first case was in 1984, Judge Weinstein, Agent Orange. And um, I just uh, go about, I'm not retiring. I pick and choose much more wisely now or selectively uh, what I want to do so that I don't travel as much around the country and everything. I'd rather mediate or claims administration on the East Coast near my home in Washington. And um, it is what it is. But there's a lot of opportunity out there. And for people on this uh, podcast, I'm sure with experience, there's plenty of work for them to do. There is indeed no shortage of conflict in our world, Ken, and no shortage of opportunities for skilled neutrals to help people resolve those conflicts, get on with their careers, get on with their lives. We are just about at the top of the hour. Ken Feinberg, thank you. If this was not a master class on mediation, I don't know what is. You are very generous with your time. You're very candid with your thoughts and opinions. I know that people who are listening, if they're in a position to do so, will support the Capital Area Food Bank. That's www.capitalareafoodbank.org, www.capitalareafoodbank.org. There's one other. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Let me give you the one other one. Bread for the city. Um, the number, I don't have the email, but here's the uh, phone number where you can get the email at. 202-265-2400. 202-265-2400. Bread for the city. Very good. Fabulous. Ken Feinberg, thank you so much. With that, we are complete. Oh,